had the pleasure of attending a wonderful conference on consciousness just recently in Cambridge called the Francis Crick Memorial Conference and everything that they showed there from studies in animals and humans seems to support this this idea that consciousness is not something that we have and nothing else has it's something that exists in many degrees sometimes it's stronger in ourselves and sometimes it's weaker sometimes we feel a little less conscious and sometimes you have animals that have more or less degrees of the same type of conscious the same kind of awareness that we have so yeah I still think it's not binary You know how I try to describe the difference between, uh, say, just looking at a brain in an MRI and saying there's activity in this region or that region when you're trying to, to come up with words or uh, do language production, speak with someone, uh, versus having an actual layout of the neural circuitry and understanding what mechanisms are going on there and then which things happen first and where the spike patterns are traveling to. There's a huge difference between those and it's the second one that we need for whole brain emulation and if you want to have a common day analogy for that something you can understand it's like having a really complex meal that you're trying to put together you have a recipe for that now just saying well it has ingredients that are somewhere in this kitchen doesn't help that's kind of like MRI that says well the functions the tasks are being carried out somewhere in the brain obviously just like the ingredients are somewhere in the kitchen. But what you need to know is exactly how all these different ingredients come together, which ones need to be put in simultaneously, which ones are coming in in a certain order, need to be prepared in some way, some kind of pre-processing, like chopping up the vegetables. It's the same type of thing. That's when you're putting together a complex meal, and in this case, carrying out a mental task also means putting together things in a very specific order and carrying out specific things. The other quote, uh, yep. the one about the platforms, um, that's relevant when people are talking about how do you choose uh, which parts of a system you're going to take into account to do this thing we call system identification. System identification being the task of trying to explain a system in such terms that you can represent it, model it, make something that works just like it. When you say just like it, you've already got a question there, which is just like what? What aspect of it? Which part are you trying to copy? Which part are you trying to replicate? That's the first question, really. So the question is what things, what effects, what behavior are you interested in? When you know that, then you can look at which signals might be involved in that behavior, in those effects. And that's really the question of, okay, we've got this piece of neural circuitry here. What are we going to have to measure and record? and use to come up with the processes that are going on there. Just like if you had a computer chip and you need to decide what are we going to measure? Are we going to measure the temperature in various parts of the chip or outside of it? Are we going to measure cosmic radiation coming in on it? Are we going to measure air pressure? Does that affect how the chip operates? Or are we just going to measure the images on the inputs that represent the bits, the ones and the zeros? And that of course is what you do if you're really interested in how the programs on the chip are running. So it depends on your goal. That's what tells you what you have to look at, which signals. So the analogy about running a Mac on a PC, that's really just an explanation of what an emulator is. Because when we talk about whole brain emulation, the idea that we can run the functions of the mind on some other kind of substrate and a different implementation, it's kind of like taking a program that's running on a PC and being able to run the same program on a Macintosh even though the two computers may be entirely different. They may be very different in the way that they consume energy, the way that they uh, warm up the table underneath them uh, and, and many other aspects of the hardware, but they'll still produce the same result when you have say a spreadsheet in that program and you're trying to calculate a result out of a couple of numbers, they should give the same result on the PC and on the Macintosh. So the software emulator that runs that spreadsheet program, the PC spreadsheet program on the Mac, that's an emulator. So. Whole brain emulation, doing this for an entire brain and uh, wanting to emulate at a high resolution is something that's uniquely important for practical applications like neural prosthetics, being able to make replacement hardware on which you can run the same functions that you have in mind. Um, it's also interesting from an academic point of view, mostly because you have total access 
to the components of a whole brain emulation. So as the mental functions are being carried out, you can observe exactly what's going on and learn more about how the brain works. Yeah, lots of them. And I just want to mention some of the biggest ones, one of them being optogenetics. So this is the work by people like Carl Disseroth and Ed Boyden, who've discovered ways of turning on and off neurons using different colors of light because they've incorporated certain channels that are light sensitive. And that's very useful for most of the tasks that we do in exploring and in creating neural interfaces and in creating methods of doing whole brain emulation. Um, also, I guess, uh, tools that, uh, that help us acquire data on the structural and functional side have been going through rapid development in the last couple of years. Um, and then a few other odd things have popped up in various places, like the development of the Memristor. And the Memristor hasn't really found many applications yet, although I'm assuming it will very shortly in, in the area of, say, new memory sticks and things like that. But it's also a very interesting uh, piece of uh, equipment if you're trying to make artificial synapses, for example. So it's an interesting thing to use on emulation hardware. I think there are many other uh, things like that that have popped up in the last few years, but uh, I'm having trouble recalling. Well, all I know is that people in the industry say that Moore's Law can certainly keep going for a few more years or maybe another decade. And that's uh, based on pretty much the same hardware we have now, maybe using more multiple cores and things like that rather than single core approaches. I don't know too much about that. I'm not an expert in the area of uh, developing hardware and where Moore's Law is going. Um, I think that it's quite possible that we may be running into some hurdles but that doesn't mean that we can't build brain hardware. We know that brain hardware is possible because the biology has already done it. So as long as we know that the example exists, we can take courage and know that we can build it as well. So you can use electron microscopy as the base for your scans, uh, which means that you need to slice up a tissue and, and look at it uh, in terms of stacks of images. Uh, or you could use something more along the lines of, uh, uh, I guess, the, the approach that Anthony Zador is using. So it's, it's a biological approach, tagging cells and using those tags to get an idea of which cell is connected to which other cell. It's a different approach and it gives you different kind of data. And in the functional realm, we also have different approaches to getting the data out. So I already mentioned the molecular ticker tape, which again is a biological approach to recording information about function. And uh, alternatively, we can use a silicon approach, so probes or electrodes, uh, or even imaging technology that can read out functions, such as uh, fluorescent dyes. Um, they all have their own particular limitations, and sometimes you need to use them in conjunction to get the right result. So Anthony is using a viral vector or something similar. I think a viral vector was the first approach that they tried and they may have a new one now to deliver pieces of DNA uh, to every cell and each of those pieces of DNA has unique code. So a cell receives one code of DNA and this artificial DNA, um, artificially created DNA, then travels up all of the axons and dendrites of the neuron and reaches the synapses where that neuron connects to others. And it crosses over one synapse and actually it becomes attached to this thing called the biotin tag that's on the synapse. So that now your receiving neuron has received the DNA that is coded for the, the, the uh, neuron in which the DNA was injected. That means that once you pick out the cells and you look at all of the snippets of DNA that have arrived there, it's like you've received little pointers, uh, ID tags that tell you where they came from. So you, in, in fact, you have bi-directional pointers between all of the cells saying this neuron is connected to that neuron and vice versa. Oh, Ed is involved in so many things that it's almost impossible to t talk about them. He has more collaborations than anyone else that I know, and it seems like he's involved in every single tool development project that relates to whole brain emulation whatsoever, both on the structural side and the functional side. He's also a very strong proponent of doing more research in this area.
So the molecular ticker tape, again, we can mention Ed Boyden because he's involved in working on this, and so is Conrad Cording, who has a lab at Northwestern University, and the George Church Lab at Harvard is involved. And the molecular ticker tape is a process where you use the amplification of DNA. Again, this is an artificial DNA strand, so you know exactly what the sequence is supposed to be, placed inside the cell. And the way the amplification works is modified by a channel that is voltage sensitive. So as a different membrane potential occurs, so there's activity in the cell, it changes something about the amplification process. One way of doing it is to have the errors that occur in the amplification increase or decrease depending on the voltage. Then when you read out the, the strand of DNA that's been created, you can see where more errors have occurred and where fewer, and it gives you a representation of the voltage that occurred over time. So you've got a ticker tape with functional data over time.